Good morning, good morning. Welcome to The First Word. I am your host, Pastor Rashi Taylor, and I am here back again with the good doctor, Dr. J. How are you today? Hey, it's another Sabbath, another day of yes. rest. It's great to be here. I'm excited about this topic. Yeah, I am excited as well. Yeah, uh, looking at it as we were preparing to to study, it's just it's got one has got some really good verses that are just just um, as we as we will soon find out, just parts of our lives and just part of uh, our development uh, yeah. from young to old. Uh, so I just I'm really super excited to talk about it. And if you haven't guessed, we are talking about the backstory of Jesus ministry. We are going into who he was before, during. And after his time here this entire week, uh, so we're going to be diving in to the good word with Dr. J. But before we get started, as we always do about this time, we here practice the SPACE acronym uh, so that we can make the, the word of God more practical, personal and portable here at the first word. So we want you to just as you make as you make your way through this, make notes that S is a sin to confess. P is a promise to claim. A is an attitude to adopt or adjust. C is a command to obey and E is an example to follow. So as we discuss this and as we go through this, just remember what the whole write down what the Holy Spirit is saying to you so that you may remember it once we are said and done here. But without further ado, we'll dive into the first word. So please give a like, share and a subscribe. Pass this on to somebody you love and that you want to see in heaven. Dr. J, can you give us a word of prayer before we start? Absolutely. God, your word is true. It's it's what we can stand on. And every time we get into it, there's something new. And we're just anticipating that something new today, God. Um, allow it to transform us. And may it be something that we can share with someone else so that the transformation can continue like a ripple effect. We love you. We thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. All right. So without further ado, we're looking at John 17, 5. And just for a bit of background, we'll share the verse. Uh, when John, when Jesus had spoken these things, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify and exalt and honor and magnify your son so that your son may glorify you and extol you. Uh, you have granted him power and authority over all flesh, all humankind. Now glorify him so that he may give eternal life to all you have given. And this is eternal life. It means to know, to perceive, recognize, become acquainted with and understand yeah. you, the only true real God. And likewise, to know him, Jesus, as the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah whom you yeah. have sent. So, Jim, my first question is, is what did Jesus mean? When he said, glorify your son, that the son may glorify you. What was he trying to convey here? Yeah. And, and when I think about that, I think about the concept of the big reveal, mm. <laughs> you know, and to glorify, you just look up a, a simple definition of glorify. It means to cause to be excellent um, or be more excellent than normally considered right? It's like you're turning something up, you're highlighting it, you're causing it to stand out, um, uncovering something, again, back to revealing something. Jesus is just like, all right, God, now it's time for the big reveal as, as, as he was getting closer to um, just the crux of the plan of salvation. But when I think about the big reveal, so you know, God be talking to me through like television shows and things that I watch, you know, it's, it's this, you know, in, in relationship, you know, you talk about anything, you know, you can share anything um, with God. And so there was a show that I used to watch um, and I'm trying to remember the name of it. And um, PT, you may remember, but uh, the, there were these, ha these home decorators and mm -hmm. they, would, they would pick a family and they would go and they'd interview the family. They because somebody recommended the family, they'd find out what was wrong with the home. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they'd send the family away and then they would like gut the home. And yes. um, when they brought the family back, they'd have like this big coach bus in front of the house, the, the new uh iteration of the mm -hmm. house, and they'd be like, Move that bus, you know. And <laughs> yeah. then they move the bus, and then it would be like, you know, it was just it was like the highlight, right? It was the yeah. big reveal was like the mm -hmm. highlight of the show. It was just yeah. like, this is all the work, all the effort, all the enthusiasm that's gone into this. 
mm -hmm. for this moment. And so that may be a poor analogy, but I feel like Jesus was like all of the, uh, you know, the work and the ministry and the miracles and the teaching and the teaching again and the reteaching. Y'all know teachers, you know what happens. And it was just like, now is the time for the big reveal. And so he's saying, uh, reveal the glory of the, the real glory of the cross, you know, um, the, the connectivity uh, of the Godhead and recognizing that his death was going to be um, not just for him, but it was to shine a light on the father. And then there's a revelation of this universal love, you know, for the world, for God so loved the world that he gave, right? Every let, let me keep going. Uh, and then there's Jesus' own honor. Um, his own honor was to be revealed, which is, and that's the fact that he and God were one, right? They were on the same team. They have the same ultimate goal. And then that was his ultimate goal um, when asking for um, glorification is that the father be revealed. Like all all of these things are coming together to to underscore, to substantiate, you know, all of scripture, um, all that came before, all the history and all that that was going to come after it. This was like the centerpiece, right? This was the mm. big reveal that was going to make everything come together and make everything relevant. Yeah, that's it. I think about the big reveal when I think. Yeah, about it. yeah. yeah. E extreme yeah. home makeover. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was that yeah. was my show. Yeah. Now, yes, exactly. Yeah. And I and I love that. Just to push it a little further. Yeah. Is is crisis is, is does that, and the person that did this had a vision, but also had a plan. Come on. Of how this thing was yes. going to be unveiled. Yes. And the people who were there couldn't imagine how yes. good it was going to be. Come they on. couldn't imagine how <laughs> how how that this house could yes. become that house. Come on. And 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 so when when the person stepped into the life, like you said, they moved them all out, took them away, and when yeah. they brought them back, it was somewhere that was far better than yeah. what they could imagine. And as we look at where we're going to eat to in, in this in this discussion about eternal life, we'll we'll yes. see that this glorification is is it starts with son revealing the father but ultimately he'll reveal to us yes. what they always envisioned and yes. planned for yes. us on the other awesome. side so one day the the the, the clouds will be by it that we remove will we pass mm. by and we'll see exactly mm -hmm. what mm. god had in store for us i love that that was excellent that appreciate mm -hmm. that appreciate that mm. so um as we get into the juicy bits of this how does god offer himself dying on the cross to save us from sin. Tell us about just how bad the sin situation really is. Yeah. I think about the wilderness sanctuary when God gave, you know, all those directives, um, this, this type of animal needs to be, uh, slain this way. And then this part of the animal goes here and all of that. And, you know, at first glance, it's like, Oh, this is gruesome. Like, this is a lot. So, you know, there's blood everywhere. There's what's, what's really going on. But at closer look, as you, as you kind of not take that out of context. And what I mean is that's not just something all into itself. It's not an Island, but there's, there's a lot of connecting pieces to that. This is the same people that, you know, Jesus brought out of the, the, out of bondage, um, to be his example, to be uh, a picture of what relationship with God and relationship with people looked like through the ages until the actual lamb came to be slain. It's like the plan of salvation, putting the, together the plan of salvation, like I don't even know what that, what that even means, what I'm saying right now, but the intricacy of that, that involved the God who created us, who decided that he was going to be a part of the antidote. He was going to be a mm. part of the, the, the answer. He was going to be a part of how sin is addressed. So going back to the wilderness sanctuary with all of the, the you know, what seems so gruesome, we don't actually understand the, 
how much of a problem sin is, you know, there's, there's obvious things around us, right? There's things that are, that are happening. Um, there's circumstances, there's disease, there's wars, there's, you know, all of this has been a part of, you know, earth's, um, history and present. But when you really think about it, when you think about what sin does to us on the mm -hmm. inside, when you think about how sin strips us of, um, you know, dignity, our, our, our understanding that we are image bearers, um, uh, strips us of our uh, ability to recognize or identify our purpose so that we can live that out in the mm -hmm. world. And so Jesus inserted himself, the, 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 the Godhead um, had this plan where Jesus inserted himself right in the middle of the mess. And that communicates to us that he's the ultimate example uh, of what it takes to address sin. We couldn't do anything. The fact that we could do not one thing, even if we tried to do uh, limitless good things, there was nothing that we could do to, to deal with sin or address it. We were already in a pit that we had no way of digging ourselves out of. But it speaks to his amazing love for mankind that he chose to be that vessel, he chose to be that that linchpin. He chose to be that element, that dynamic that would actually give us an opportunity to come out of the pit, to come out of the slime. You know, I um, it communicates his his deep desire to deal with it. You know, he could have been like, "Oh well, I'll start over." <laughs> you know. But he went the distance to ensure that there was a way of escape. It just speaks to this overwhelming, and I don't understand it, but I'm so glad to have this overwhelming, you know, invaluable love, you mm. know, from God. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, and as you, as you were, you were just describing it, it's almost, it's almost heartbreaking to know the the effect that sin has. And as you pointed out, the part that really kind of was the, the the little gut punch was there's yeah. no matter of good that I can do to undo what I've done. Right. Like, you know, we, we say yeah. that and we, we think, but if you think about it, we've all had incidents where we've hurt someone. Yeah. And so if, if, if you've hurt someone bad enough, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years later, they'll still bring that up. Sometimes they may bring it up and laugh about it, Yeah, but it's still a part still. of it. Exactly. So, so, so sin, even, even in, 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 in our uh, finite ability to, to, to do things, we can't erase those things that we've done on the playground or we've done in high school or whatever, because that's still a part of somebody's narrative. And so yeah. no matter what I do, I can't take that away from yeah. myself off my resume, but also yeah. from the impact that it's, it's had on someone else. And they may have in their hurt, pass that on to their family. So it's still, my sin is still resonating or Mercy. ripple affecting mm -hmm. their life. And only a God mm -hmm. who formed us out of clay could yeah. remove that stain from us. Yeah. And he's the only person who loved it. I mean, he, 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 only they could have saved us and only they could have imagined yeah. Yeah. This, this deliverance from, from, from sin yes. as, as powerful as it is. Yes. It's, yes. It's crazy. When for humanly speaking, I'm just like, mm -hmm. ah, uh, uh, let's just scrap this. Let's just scrap mm -hmm. this. Let's just toss this out. Like, <laughs> yes. why? Why would I want to do all of that? Right, so right. it's baffling, but I'm so grateful. Mm -hmm. I'm so grateful. Yeah. 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 So as we as we were were reading those um those those verses, uh, what is there somebody that that, that you have in mind? And one of my one of my um videos I used to watch was, was a guy named, by the name of Freddie Haynes. And he was, he was saying something that I had always tried to do in my classroom is, all right, so when I'm, when I'm putting something together, who needs to hear this, Mercy. right? Who is this really for? Um, Cause everybody doesn't, doesn't necessarily need every sermon. So as you, as you kind of look at the, the messages in these verses, is there yeah. somebody that, that you would love to hear or, 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 or a person you would like to focus on with the messages from these words? 
Yeah, definitely. And it's personal. Um, mm. I would focus on the person who needs to know that, that you are loved, that you are accepted, um, that you belong here. Um, because life will have you out here thinking that you don't matter, that you don't have anything to offer, that people will have you experiences with people, broken people, break people. I, I just made that up, you know, hurt people, hurt people. We've heard that saying. And so our experiences with people often will leave us wondering, am I lovable? Am I worthy? Am I valued? You know, those types of things. And there's so many people out here, like we're passing by them. They're people that we work with. They're people that we go to church with. They're people who live next to us. They're people that we're passing in the store. People are really struggling with that self-worth and with understanding that just the way you are, just how you are, God loves you and he accepts you. And there's more to that, right? But I think about um, Exodus 34, six and seven, which is like one of my favorite verses because God shows us exactly who he is, right? Especially in verse six. Um, and this is when he um, was dealing with Moses. Um, and this is right after, I want to say this is right after the, the people that he brought out of the wilderness, that he brought out of, I'm sorry, brought out of bondage, that he miraculously brought out of bondage, went back on the, on, 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 went back on his, they went back on his front. They, they, they were just like, um, we're, we're, we're going to, you know, we're going to do our own thing. After he miraculously brought them out, had been providing for them, but they, you know, it's developmental. They had to learn. Right. And, and, um, he's, he's talking to Moses. Moses is disappointed, all of that. But he tells him, he says, the, then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, which is faithfulness, keeping mercy and loving kindness for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. You know, I, he tells us who he is. And the first thing that he tells us, and unfortunately, so many different belief systems or um um, uh, positions and stances that religious people have had will make you think that God is sitting around waiting for you to mess up so he can mm. slap, you know, knock mm -hmm. you out, slap you across the face. But the first thing that he tells Moses, and this is a, a message relating to the children who had just messed up big time. I'm compassionate. I'm gracious. I'm slow to anger. I'm abounding in loving kindness and faithfulness. So he's just like, this is who I am. This is the God come. And to me, that saying, just come close, just come, just come, mm -hmm. bring all your, bring all of your messiness, bring all of your, bring all of your, your, your issues. Just come. I just want you. I want you here. And so I would, I would send that message to somebody who feels like they don't matter. Hmm. Mm -hmm. who feels like they're not worth it. I want you to know that there is a God who loves you. Um, and the first thing that he wants is you. Because one, you look like him. You're, you're an image bearer. And he wants you. I, I think about another, another show on TLC Extreme Makeover. Man, I loved this show because the designers would, they would get with the person in the beginning and they'd have, it was almost like therapy. They would have like this little sit down and they would tell them to bring their clothes out of the closet because someone felt like this person needed like a wardrobe makeover. And so they would sit with a the person, they talk and the person would talk through, these are why, this is why I wear this. This is why I choose to dress like this. This is why I, you know, and there was no, you're trash, um, you know, you, you, that's stupid. Why are you wearing that? But they would bring them in with the end game being, we're going to provide you with a look that you didn't know was possible, right? So in the process, 
They'd show them how to shop for their body type. They would show them different styles. They would educate them. They would show them what was what was um, what they could have in terms of of hair and makeup and 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 then there was again there's a big reveal right. So Jesus is like, I love you first and foremost. You belong here. Just come. Don't worry. Bring all of, bring all of your your stuff because I'm going to. We're going to walk together and I'm going to help you sort through all of that. And I'm not not only I'm going to help you do that, I'm going to help you discover the potential that you were prepackaged with, that you came here with, that I put inside of you. And the finished product is going to be and the people when they they don't let them see themselves when they do the makeup, when they do the hair and then they get dressed and then they put them in front of a mirror. And it's just like they are floored. They're floored because they've never seen themselves look like that. They didn't know that they had the potential. And I just see that as that journey that we take with God. And so for God so loved the world, I want to glorify the Father. This is the work that I've done on your behalf. And this is the work that I will do. And you personally, right? It's it's this journey that we take together. But I want you to know that you belong, that you are loved, that you are valued, that you have a unique contribution to this world. And just, you know, come and get that from Jesus. Come and get that. Get anchored in Jesus first. And when he starts walking with you, the discoveries that you will make are going to be mind-blowing. You're going to have your own big reveals as you go along the way. Yeah, yeah I love that. I love that. And my favorite part uh, of that show, because I used to watch that one too, was, ah! when, <laughs> was yeah. when the person who recommended them for the show kind of explain you know they they oh yeah you know, my That's mom right. used to be this and she used to be that and then Come my on. dad passed yes and this person always showed why they cared enough to yes. give that person over to somebody who yes. could help them so ah. friends of friends out there ah. I if, if you know somebody and you love somebody there's somebody who can who has a vision for them who can put them mm -hmm. in the right robe I mean right clothes mm -hmm. and 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 cover them but also give them a, a perspective of themselves yeah. that they never yeah. had. My last question for you, Jen, yeah. is uh, uh, what's what's the most important part of this 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 passage that we've been discussing the last few minutes? So there's a powerful message in uh, seventeen three John seventeen three, um, which says, and I, I lost it here for a second. Let's see. Hey, there we go. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true supreme sovereign God, and in the same manner, know Jesus as the Christ whom you have sent. Like we were talking about that big reveal, but in this verse, I think the conclusion of the whole matter is the God who did all of this heavy lifting on our behalf, but God who so loved the world um, that he gave his only begotten son, we can know this God. We can be in relationship, in personal relationship with this God. Um, when I was in high school, um, I was at Oakwood Academy here in Huntsville and um, this was like a million years ago. But yes, of course. <laughs> but on and, and anybody who's watching this who went to Oakwood um, back in the, the 90s, you'll remember uh, in the Bible classroom on the back wall was this huge uh, stenciled verse. And it may have been um, three and four um, it, or it may have been two and three. Uh, but all I remember is now this is eternal life. I remember that. And it didn't sink in until years later um, when I uh, finally allowed God's love to seep into my spiritual pores and into my spiritual bloodstream. And, and it ran through my whole system and it, as it relates to this relationship and the contextual um, dynamic that all of this growth, all of the learning, all of the unlearning takes place in this relationship. And so for anyone who feels like God is this um, faraway concept or he's not real, I, I just want you to know that this verse sums up 
the whole thing, the whole bottom line of the gospel. He's saying, you can know me. You, no go between. You don't have to have a proxy. There's no 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 uh, um, representative. But the veil was torn when Jesus died, and we have direct access to the Father, and that's so powerful. That's so powerful. It's the relationship that makes the difference that solidifies all of this. And so, from Genesis to Revelation, we see a picture of God pursuing relationship with mankind throughout the centuries, throughout progression, uh, industrial revolution, wars, uh, uh, countries being born and, and developing, technology advancements, through all of humanity shenanigans, God is still pursuing human beings. He's still pursuing you. He's pursuing me. And so this is eternal life. This is the crux of the whole matter. This is this is this is what it is, and I love it because it's just distilled down to this this one verse and um, this whole Christ following thing. This is the whole point because God wants a relationship with you. Yeah, yeah. God wants a relationship with you. Yeah. He has granted you access, and yeah. it's the relationship. That makes the difference. He's already done the heavy lifting. He's already yes. kicked down the door. He's already torn down the veil. All you have to do yeah. is approach. Yeah. So uh, I want to thank you, Dr. J, for getting us uh, warmed up, starting us on this journey and letting us see that it's really the relationship that God has been fighting so hard for to give us the love that we kind of threw away, right? We, yes. we, we we messed up on our end of the covenant, but he's done all he can to restore the breach and build that bridge. And so we're hoping that somebody will cross over. I want to thank you, my sister. Our next guest is in the green room and they're ready to get started, but we want to say goodbye to Dr. J and we'll bring our next guest right on out. All right, good people. We have coming to the the room now. We now have waiting in the wings. Dr. Drew is, is showing up and Dr. Drew is just going to talk to us, uh, continue the conversation on with us. He's going to talk to us about John 1, 1 through 5 and John 1, 14, as we see that Christ was there in the beginning. He was the word and nothing that was made was made without him. Dr. Drew, how are you doing today, brother? I'm doing pretty good. How about yourself? Man, I am doing fantastic. I cannot complain. Um, I'm excited to, to, to continue this conversation with you. We're looking at John 1, uh, 1 through 5 and verse 14 for your section. So what do these verses kind of tell us about Jesus and, more importantly, what he did? Well, one of the things that I really like about this whole verse is just even the way, way it starts off, you know, in in verse one, how it says, in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was God himself. Now, a lot of people like to skip this verse in particular, just because it's it's a more of a tongue twister, you know, almost like if, from the old adage, who's on first <laughs> versus who's on second type of thing. But But if you just take a moment and take a closer look at it, it's really that simple. It's saying that God and his word and his promises and the Godhead has always been there always has been, always will be, and is current today. And that's it. There's no complication. There's no extra levels to it that, that really needs to be added. But if you can understand that, that there's a being that always has been and always will be, then that can clarify that statement. Now, once you come to that understanding, we then move into verse 14. Um, and if you can give me a moment, I would love to read it for you guys. Um, it states, and the word Christ became flesh, and tabernacled among us. And we actually saw his glory, such glory as an only begotten son receives from his father, full of grace and truth. Now, one of the things with this particular verse that I really appreciate is it talks about how God the Father, God the Son, and, and it alludes to the Holy Spirit as well, like I said, the Trinity, and how they were all three in one. But Christ was sent down to heaven. He became man incarnate 
on our behalf because at this point sin had entered into the world adam and eve had fell and we were facing certain death if we didn't have a savior if we didn't have some type of intervention and it was only someone at the level of God that could rescue us. It had to be somebody without sin, somebody uh, without mark or blemish. And Christ was the only one that could fulfill that. So he became man, dwelt among us, and he died so that we could live. So to me, this all captures all of that in just one very short synopsis. And this is why I love this chapter so much. Oh, we can't hear you, Pastor. I got so excited, I, I forgot to take myself off mute. It was literally the verse I read in college that made me realize who Jesus was, right? Like, mm -hmm. so we grew up understanding that Jesus made the sacrifice. And I kind of found out that he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world by hearing it and, and reading it, but never made the connection that, hold on, Jesus was our creator. Hold on, Jesus was our creator and he knew that he was going to have to die hold on jesus was our creator and he knew that he was going to have to die before he made us you know what i'm saying so it was like all of these little links in the chain of understanding christ and it was it was i read that in college and i've never been able to see that differently so my my next question is to you is what would we lose if jesus was merely just a created being you know made we're made a little lower than the angels what if he was just something or someone made higher than the angels, but still made not God eternal himself? What what happens to us if we lose or what do we lose if Jesus is just a mere created being? We lose our salvation. We, mm. we, we lose everything because one of the things that happened once sin entered the world is we needed someone at that level of God. We needed someone, like I said, clean, without blemish, without stain, without spot. And all the created beings below that had that ability. Um, like I said, you, you think about the fallen heaven. Those were created beings that had that gift of choice and some of them chose wrong. So you needed somebody that could do no wrong, that was sinless to give themselves as a sacrifice for us in order to have a second chance. Um, so without that, we literally are doomed. Um, from what we know now again god's ways are not mine god's understanding is not mine but that that is a simple equation to me it, it we needed something without sin without blemish without stain without spot to take our spot as the sacrifice for our sins and if christ was just merely a created being that wouldn't be enough and we would still be lost mm, so it, and I, I i love that that if without him there's no salvation um, without him, we would not be saved. Without him as God dying for man, we would never be saved. I appreciate that. It's a, I, and I'm sure you, you've you seen this and probably use this as well. But it's something I like to share with my students that um, in, a, in a movie uh, called Infinity War slash Endgame, Dr. Strange is doing his Dr. Strange thing. And he says out of one million 14 million, excuse me, 608 ways, scenarios that he's seen. There's only one way that's out that that they save and they win. And if there was another way, then there would have been another way. But Christ and Christ alone was the only way the three infinite beings of our universe saw that we could be saved. And so there was no other way that our creator also be our savior also be the entity known as the son of god if there was another way they would have done it another way right so now if i could take that a step further now i know i'm wearing a Please. superman shirt but you know i am Please. a marvel fan ride mm -hmm. or die but you also remember from that movie when um he was talking to iron man mm -hmm. and he asked him you know is this the way that mm -hmm. we were going to win and mm -hmm. dr strange's response was if i told you it wouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. What instantly popped in my head was when Christ was going through the crucifixion and he was like, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Or when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was praying, if <laughs> if it could be taken away, take this mm -hmm. cup away. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, it, it reminded me of that echo and where it's like, even 
Christ during the experience, mm -hmm. you know, was 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 feeling that struggle, feeling that mm -hmm. way. But it's like, but it was the only way. That's right. There, that was the one and only way that they had to go through it. So, you know, uh, yeah. Appreciate the the moral shout out, but it's it's fun. <laughs> even that can lead you back, you know, into God. Yeah, heart. yeah. It's 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 the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, yes. Sir. Um. So so let's let's say that you're at a a Sabbath dinner tomorrow afternoon, and someone, I mean, a Sabbath dinner this afternoon, and and someone says to you, uh, "Why would John start out talking about Jesus in his role as creator? Is it important to have a correct understanding of creation? How would you answer?" this relative who may not even be a believing person uh, or maybe a newly believing person, but they're trying to really understand, is it important to have a correct understanding of creation? How would you answer that? Well, my thought is this, you know, we're all children of someone. And, and when we are first born, we have this natural desire of to be close to our mother. We have this natural desire for our fathers, you know, and, and things of that sort. And as we get older, in most circumstances, we have this adoration, we have this respect, um, we, we have this attachment to our parents. Um, and we want to do things that are pleasing in them. We want to make them proud. Um, we, we, we want to further on what we know of, of our bloodline, so to say. And I feel like the same thing happens with Christ. You know, we have to understand that he is a part of that creation of, of not only just the world we walk on, but us as well. You know, the verse says, you know, we were made in his image. You know, and, and we're talking about the Trinity, not just God, the father, but God, the son and of the Holy Spirit as well. So it's having that understanding of who made you should help you to better understand why you should have that allegiance towards them. You know, like I said, regardless of the relationship that we have with our parents, you know, we were born having that natural inclination to want to be close to them, to want to, to be with them and things of that sort. And the same thing goes for our heavenly father as well. You know, he made us, he created us, and we should want to have that desire even now to still be close, to still have that relationship and to just further it deeper and deeper as we move forward in life. Man, I, I appreciate that. It's 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 amazing that God went through all the trouble to send his only begotten son for us to still misunderstand him. Right. Like it's it's a. Uh, it's it's one of those things that um, as as a parent you you mentioned or as as children you mentioned, but it's 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 super important for I think an individual to be understood. And one of the things uh, one of my principals used to tell us is seek to understand first, then to be understood. So God went through four thousand years of of understanding man and 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 revealing himself in snapshots and previews. But then he gave himself completely for the revelation of who he is. And so understanding creation and understanding him, it, understanding creation and understanding the creator is the ultimate revelation of who he is. And that's all that he's been trying to do is, is from the beginning to the end is show us who he is. And we talked about this uh, earlier with Jen that he, he says to Moses, and I'll just paraphrase that I am a long suffering God, compassionate and loving and kind and this and merciful. Right. And that's who he, that's how he identifies. God is love. And so if we miss him as creator, we miss a huge portion of ourselves, let alone who he is, man. So I, I, I really appreciate that. And my last question to you before we, we bring in uh, Ms. Rochelle is uh, what do you think is the most important thing the, the audience ought to take from this this time in uh, John 1, 1 through 5? Well, for me, if I can just read it fairly quickly in verse sure. 5, it states, and the light shines on in the darkness, mm. but the darkness has never overpowered it, put it out or absorbed it or appropriated it and is unreceptive to it. Um, and again, this is that that old adage that you hear a lot of grandmothers say, you know, light and dark can never be in the same place. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like one one has to flee. Right. And if you really take a look at society, I feel like a lot of times you see people really pushing to try to co-mingle the two. And the fact is, it just can't. Um, God is 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 definitely a God of mercy, but he is a God of absolutes where light is darkness cannot abound as well. One has to go. 
Um, and the great thing about God is he also is a God of choice. If, if you want to stay in the dark, he's not going to force light into that area. He, he will let you stay in darkness now. He's going to keep trying to woo you back. He's going to keep calling you to come back to the light. Um, but it's ultimately our choice where we want to be. Do you want to stay in the dark or do you want to move to the light? Um, because that's what God's word is. It's a light unto our path. And I just want to encourage everyone this morning, this afternoon or this evening, whenever you're seeing this, that just go into the light. It, it is much brighter. It is much warmer. And it leads to much better days than if you just stay in the dark. Well, my brother, I appreciate you uh, inviting us to stay in the light, uh, inviting us to enjoy the warmth that warmth that is the, the 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 sunshine of God's love. We thank you for spending this time with us. Uh, let's let's give it up for Dr. Drew as we say goodbye to him. And Dr. Drew, we thank you for coming again. We will see you next week, my brother. Until the next time. All right, man. Have a good one. All right, coming up. Right after Dr. Drew is Miss Rochelle McLean. She's going to come and teach us, reach us, and preach to us in her own giftedness. In her own giftedness. Hi, everybody. Hey, P. Good, good, good. All right. So, Rochelle, as we're looking at um, John 1 and John 17 and, and all of these other verses that kind of really, I mean, chapters that kind of bring in the power of Jesus, the purpose of Jesus, the role of Jesus as creator. Um, what is, uh, as, 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 as we dive into this, I just want to ask you, how do these texts kind of repeat over and over the theme of belief versus unbelief in this, in this prologue? Yes. Yeah, so in John, there is a reoccurring theme of belief and unbelief. And um, in John 3, verse 16 to 21, we have the universal offer of salvation, one of the most popular verses in the Bible of all time. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The text contrasts those who believe and come into the light, as Dr. Drew was saying, with those who love darkness and reject Jesus, emphasizing how disbelief stems from a refusal to step into the truth. And this echoes the prologue statement that Jesus, as the true light, came into the world, but was not accepted by all. And we see that in John 1, verse 9 to 11. Also in John 9, verse 35 through 41, we see this theme of unbelief and belief again displayed in the healing of the blind man. And we talked about that last week. The man's progression from physical blindness to spiritual sight, aka belief in Jesus, contrasts with the Pharisees who remain spiritually blind because of their unbelief. Jesus uses this to show that those who recognize their need for spiritual sight, belief will be healed while those who claim that they see self-righteousness and unbelief remain in darkness. This connects with the prologue's idea of the rejection of Jesus by the world, even though he was the true light. And in John 12, verse 36 to 43, Jesus warns the people to believe in the light while they still have it. Once you get that truth, believe it immediately. Remember Lot's wife. Don't delay. Despite Jesus' many miracles, many continued in unbelief, fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy. The theme of belief slash unbelief is again shown as a personal choice where some believed but did not publicly confess out of fear while others hardened their hearts. This passage again echoes the prologue's tension between those who receive Jesus and become children of God, John 1 verse 12, and those who do not believe. Here's a personal application question. It says, in what ways do you live out your faith in Jesus rather than just holding a mental Ascent to him being the Messiah. So we have to move from a theoretical knowledge of Jesus 
and transition to an experiential knowledge of Jesus. Jesus is real. He is our forever friend. And he wants a daily walk with us. He cares about every detail of your life. I asked the Lord, what should we wear today? How should I do my hair today? He is like a hovering parent, but in a good way. You can talk to him about any and everything. He wants to know about your health, your relationships, your finances, everything. Currently, I'm a single mom dealing with bills, managing a household, basketball schedules, soccer schedules, gymnastics on my own. But I know that I am not alone. When my kids act up, I say, Lord, you better get your kids. These were your ideas. This is your invention. And, you know, I just laugh it out with God because he is my best friend. Here's a case study. One of your neighbor's states, have you ever had questions about the character of God or the Father? Do you think they exhibit differences in their characters in the Bible? How do you deal with doubts about God's character? And how would you respond to your neighbor? So if my neighbor asked this question, right, I would approach it thoughtfully, but with empathy. First, I would acknowledge that it's natural to have questions or doubts about God's character, especially when we encounter difficult circumstances or troubling passages in scripture that don't make sense to us. I would also emphasize that asking questions is a part of growing in faith and understanding. God is not like a cult where you better not ask questions. You better not watch where the money goes. God is not like that. He says, come, let us reason together. Regarding the character of God, the Father, and Jesus, I would explain that the Bible teaches they share the same character and nature. In John 14, 9, Jesus says, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. This verse highlights that Jesus is the perfect representation of the Father's character, his love, his mercy, his long suffering, his justice. Throughout the four Gospels, Jesus demonstrates compassion, forgiveness, and self sacrificing love, which mirrors the Father's heart. While it may seem at times that the Father and Jesus exhibit different characteristics, especially when you compare the Old Testament stories with the New Testament, it's important to interpret scripture as a whole. Hebrews 13 verse 8 reminds us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, reinforcing the consistency of God's character across time. When we look at the sanctuary, every furniture is all about Jesus. When you look through the Old Testament stories, Samson, Joshua, Moses, these are all types of Christ. It's all about Jesus. What might appear as differences often stem from incomplete understanding or context. So to deal with doubts about God's character, I would suggest three approaches. Number one, seek to understand scripture in context. Sometimes specific passages seem harsh or confusing, but deeper study often reveals cultural, historical, or redemptive reasons behind God's actions. Number two, focus on the overarching narrative of scripture. The Bible reveals a God who is patient, loving, and just. The story of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, where the Father gave his Son to save humanity, demonstrates his deep love for us. John 3, verse 16, that famous verse. And number three, bring your doubts to God in prayer. God is not afraid of our doubts. He's not afraid of our questions. When we are confused or troubled, God invites us to bring our questions to him. James 1 verse 5 tells us that God gives us wisdom to those who ask for it. This would be the beginning of an ongoing conversation where we can seek understanding together and remaining open to learning more about God's consistent loving character. And I would tell them that I experienced for myself that God is good. He has been so patient and kind with me, even when I was loud and wrong. You ever heard that statement, being loud and wrong? 
He rebuked me gently, which encourages me to deal with my own children and my students gently, which is not always easy when they keep making bad choices and they disrespectful on top of it. So I tell God that I don't want to be like one of those Bible characters who sinned against God, especially after a wonderful victory like Elijah on Mount Carmel. I don't want to be like Manasseh or King Josiah in the end who rebelled against God by going after King Nico. But even if we sin, we have an advocate, Jesus, who will forgive us and cleanse us of all sins. All right. All right. Oh, look, look, I don't like that. There we go. <laughs> so, so before we let you go, um, just, just give us a short thought on what you think may be the most important part of this passage or the part that you want us to carry home with us as, as you, uh, before you leave us. Okay. So just like in John, we ourselves in our lives, we have a pattern, a reoccurring theme of unbelief and belief even in our own lives. There were times where we didn't believe and God chased after us. We have struggled between believing God's promises over our lives, especially when he says to wait. We love a yes and we can accept a no, but wait, in my opinion, that's the toughest answer because you never know when God will deliver on his promises. Do I have to wait as long as Abraham, uh, 100 years old, 99 years old, and Sarah or as Hannah? But we know that God is good. And there is a reason why he's making us wait. We pray that God will help us to wait well while he works out things behind the scenes that we know not. Wow. Great word. Wait well. Wait well. Uh, <laughs> well that's, that's, that's the hardest thing I used to joke Um before that, you know, one of the hardest things to see is you're in a restaurant, you're hungry, you place your order, but you see people who come in after you. Yeah. Get get With their food big old first. Platter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it <laughs> and it has to go past you, right? So you got to yeah. see everybody else getting what they want or getting what they ask for. And I think that's that's a great word. We have to learn to wait well while we wait. Yes, no, maybe more acceptable, but wait is something that we all have to learn to do. Ms. Rochelle, Ms. McLean, I thank you for, for joining us. I thank you for showing up and showing out in this brief time with us today. We thank you. We appreciate your gift, and we will see you next time. Bye, everybody. Bye, PT. Bye. Have a good one now. You too. We thank Ms. Rochelle for stopping by. And we are going to close out here with our final thought. It says the, there is but one God the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. There is this belief that if we take Jesus out or if we remove him as creator or if we remove him as God, that somehow there's clarity. But he says here that it is only through him whom we live through him all things came and another verse says in him all things consist so he's the main ingredient in our faith he's the main ingredient in our understanding he's the main ingredient in our life and none of this makes sense without him and none of this consists without him and more importantly none of this exists without him so as you go forward remember or, or 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 maybe as you scan and survey your life maybe what's missing is your creator jesus maybe what's missing is your savior jesus maybe what's missing is the lord jesus christ himself so i just hope that you add him in to those areas that you may have left him out and see if your life isn't more abundantly. I thank you. This is the first word where we let the Bible have the last word. I'm Pastor Taylor. I will see you again next time.